I matched with this one guy named Steve on Tinder. I wasn't looking for anything serious or a hookup or anything of that nature. Maybe friends, I guess. I don't know. I was just bored. That was really it. I thought he seemed cool because we had similar interests in music, style, clothes, and etc. I started talking to him and only after a few hours, he got my Snapchat and started messaging me there. He started asking if I wanted to hang out later that night. I didn't reply for maybe 30 minutes or so. And that's when he started sending me multiple messages at once, without a response from me first. He sent me a question mark, and then 15 minutes later he sent another message that said hello with a question mark. I don't like when people do that, and it gives kind of a red flag to me, especially when it's someone you have never met before online. I then started ignoring him altogether because it made me a little uncomfortable. In my experience, when a guy does that and it's someone that you've never met, they are usually very needy and sometimes controlling, so I steered myself away and didn't think much of it. I was out on a walk with my dog at a nearby park that I usually take him to a few times a week. I live in an apartment so I like to make sure he really gets the exercise he deserves. We took a short break by this bench where I sat down for a few minutes, just enjoying the view you know, and relaxing out in the nice spring weather for a moment, appreciating nature. Maybe after 10 minutes of sitting there, a random guy starts running my way. Emily, hey, is that you? Uh, it's me, Steve. I was just wondering what you were up to. Nice to meet you. What a coincidence. We just ran into each other, he said. Um, yeah, I said with a concerned look on my face. I started panicking because I knew something was wrong. This didn't feel like a coincidence. It didn't take long before I realized that he wasn't even the guy in the pictures. He had been catfishing me. That immediately sent a shiver down my spine and I knew I was in for trouble. Then I remembered I had my snapchat location turned on to all my friends. I forgot that I turned it on months ago to test something and I forgot to turn it back off apparently. This man was literally stalking me. He slowly started to harass me more and more as he knew I was getting more frustrated and disinterested in him and what he was asking me by the second. At first it was by asking if I still wanted to hang out. I ended up telling him to leave me alone and that he was scaring me. It didn't take long before he started yelling at me. I was honestly shook and at this point I was in fight or flight mode. My dog started barking at him in order of an attempt to protect me. He backed up just a bit but continued harassing me with his words. He began saying some very disgusting things that I don't care to even share right now. Just know they were really inappropriate and horrible things that you should never say to someone. Thankfully some old man who was jogging by recognized I was being harassed and he scared him off. I'm so thankful for that man. Cause I don't know what else would have happened had someone not stepped in and intervened. The guy took off and I've never heard from him since and I obviously blocked him on everything. I'm still on edge and sometimes I worry I will run into him when I'm alone or something. Please just be careful who you talk to on the internet. This could happen anywhere at any time. So this story happened to my mum's friend in Korea about 10 years ago. Every time I hear this story, I still get chills. My mum's friend lived in an apartment complex in Seoul. She was a stay-at-home mother with a young daughter, and her husband was working during the days. One day, she was coming home from running errands with her daughter, and got onto the elevator in her building. When she got inside the elevator, she noticed there was a man wearing a cap and a yellow raincoat, and he kept his head low, so she couldn't really see his face. She immediately felt really uneasy, and she made her daughter stand by her side, the side farthest away from the man. What made her feel even more uncomfortable was, when she pressed the button for her floor, there was no other lit number. And on top of that, she noticed that he was carrying something wrapped inside newspaper close to his side. Things started to click in my mum's friend's head, and she started to panic and decided to take out her cell phone and pretend she was calling home to her husband, who was obviously really not at home, but at work. She started saying things like, Oh, I'm on the elevator and about to get off. Can you get the door for me? And making it seem like her husband was waiting at home. When the elevator did reach her floor, she quickly got off and grabbed her daughter and started to walk as fast as she could to her apartment. 
she noticed that the man also got on her floor and was slowly following her down the hallway. When my mum's friend got to her door, she started banging on it really loudly and shouting, Hey, Yobo, I'm home. Please open the door. Yobo means husband or dear. She was kind of pretending like he was coming to open the door. Upon seeing this, the man in the yellow raincoat started to walk away, back towards the elevator. When he seemed to be far enough away, my mum's friend quickly picked up her daughter and slid open her door's passcode thingy. This is usually how people get into their homes in Korea. And she started to frantically punch in her key code. But the problem was that the buttons would make sounds so that the man knew that no one was going to answer the door for her. And he turned around and started to run back towards her. My mum's friend at this point was practically screaming. And the first thing she did when she opened the door was throw her daughter inside. When she got inside herself, she saw that the man was practically inches away from the door. But she managed to shut it and lock it just before he could wedge his hand or a weapon in through the door. Afterwards, looking through the door's peephole, she saw that the man was walking away, back towards the elevator. Several months pass, and my mum's friend was watching the news, and there was a coverage on the capture of a serial killer named Yu Young Chul, who used to kill a lot of prostitutes. She told my mum that she could never forget the dread she felt when she saw the all-too-familiar yellow raincoat and the same hat that he was wearing when he was apprehended. The person who submitted this story has included a wiki page on Yu Young Chul, in case anyone was curious. It also details all of his killings. A link to this page can be found in the description below. My Mom's Experience with the Dead From Daniela S. My mom was in the hospital when she was 23. She'd gotten in a really bad motorcycle accident and had broken both her legs. She'd also hurt her head really bad. It was late in the night and she woke up from a very restless sleep. But she didn't open her eyes right away for some reason. Something in her told her to keep them shut. My mom is from Vietnam and grew up in a very spiritual family. This subject isn't something she takes lightly. When she finally did open her eyes, it was because of a murmur, like someone was trying to talk to her. Her hospital bed was surrounded by pale people. The whole room seemed to be filled with pale people, all trying to get a good look at her. But as soon as she looked at them, they all began to look down at their feet. She was in such shock that she kind of just calmed down and tried to make sense of it. The murmuring grew louder and louder until it sounded like the whole room was quietly mumbling, dozens of people mumbling to each other. But she couldn't see anyone's lips actually move. Then one of them lifted their hand and tried to reach out to her, still not looking at her. That's when my mom began to panic and scream. She says it felt like she blacked out until a nurse came running in, but my mom was found sitting up in bed. The nurse told her it was probably a hallucination from her concussion, and after a long time of soothing her, mom finally went back to sleep. She didn't experience anything else until she got pregnant with me, and we moved to Korea. One day as she was taking the bus, she noticed that amongst a line of people getting on was a very familiar figure, a pale person who only looked at the ground. They boarded the bus. The bus driver didn't even seem to acknowledge them. My mother began to cry and became hysterical when the person moved down the middle of the bus. It was then she saw that they seemed to be floating. 
Their feet were flat against nothing beneath them. An older woman came to comfort her, and when Mom looked back where the person had been, they were gone. From that day until we moved to America, she had no further problems. Eventually, she would be pregnant with my brother, and she began seeing these people everywhere, in the stores, in the streets, and even outside our home. It was a difficult pregnancy. She ended up going to the hospital a number of times, with smaller complications. When she was there, she would scream and cry if she was ever left alone. In the hospitals, it's where she saw them most. She said they were everywhere. Every which way she looked, they were there. The only way she'd feel safe was if someone was with her, because then the strange, pale people wouldn't come any closer. The night after she gave birth to my brother, we were all sleeping in one room because she'd been pretty wrecked by the delivery. The hard pregnancy was nothing compared to actually giving birth to him. Dad says she nearly died, but I don't know how much of that is true. She woke up again in the middle of the night with my brother next to her, and again her bed was surrounded by those people. One of them was holding her hand on the baby's forehead, and at first my mom freaked until she noticed how my brother was pale. But instead of calling out for help, she didn't move. The pale woman stroked the baby's hair over and over, until he began to grow pink again, and finally he took a breath. Then she woke up in the morning as a nurse came in to look at the baby. The pale people were gone. Dad and I were still sleeping, and nothing seemed different. The nurse looked over my brother and said that he was fine. Mom says that at that moment, she realized that whoever they were, they weren't trying to hurt or scare her. She thinks they're just lost souls or something of the sort, and that her son did almost die that night. But one of them helped him back to life. Then again, This happened a few years ago on Halloween. I'm 28 years old, and most people in my friend group get together for a Halloween party the weekend of Halloween. On this year, Halloween was on a weeknight, so our party was later in the week. That meant I didn't have anything going on on Halloween. I live in a smaller house, and was just planning on hanging out and giving out candy to trick-or-treaters all night. By the time it got to be about 5 o'clock, the first trick-or-treaters arrived. I would say my neighborhood is pretty average. I don't get a crazy number of people but a steady amount throughout the night. As time went on, the sun set a little after six o'clock or so. It was around this time when I was in my living room and heard a knock on the front door. It was a strong and powerful knock. Most people rang the doorbell, so I really noticed this. I was a little bit slow to get up and get to the door, and by the time I did, nobody was there. I felt bad because some kid must have missed out on getting candy from me, and I meant to answer the door a little bit sooner. I looked around to see if I could see anybody walking down the street, but I didn't. After that, I went back inside. I got a few more kids at the door over the next hour or so. And once again, there was another loud knock on the door after that. I was much quicker to answer the door, but again, nobody was there. Now I was beginning to think that I was being pranked or something. When it got later in the night, it happened yet again. It was the only time people knocked on the door, too. Everybody else would just ring the doorbell. So I knew when I heard the knock, whoever had done it would be gone by the time I answered. The last trick-or-treaters came by at about 8.45 or so, and by 9 o'clock, things were really quiet. At that point, I turned my lights off, signaling that I wouldn't want any more trick-or-treaters. It was about 9.30 when I heard the knocking yet again. I ran to the door and opened it as fast as I could. Still, nobody was there. I was pretty annoyed by this now. Who would have time to repeatedly knock on my door over the span of three or four hours just to run away before I could answer? I left my house and took a couple of steps out into my yard looking all around. I didn't see anybody. I called out asking who was there, but of course got no response. I shook my head and started walking back into my house. When I reached my front step, I suddenly heard a noise in the bushes directly in front of my house and to my right. When I looked, I was just in time to see somebody emerge from the bush and was headed straight for me. This person was a grown man 
and I had never seen him before. I had maybe ten feet between him and the front door. I ran as fast as I could, pretty much just as a reaction. When I reached the door, I swung it back open and got inside. I closed the door right behind me, and it closed right on the man's arm who was trying to get inside after me. This was just my screen door, so it didn't hurt him too bad, but it was enough to cause him to remove his arm from the door and back outside. This gave me enough time to slam the larger door and lock it, right before he opened the screen door and tried coming into my house. I screamed that I was calling the police, and then got my phone out of my pocket to do so. I looked out the window, and I watched the man running away through my yard and then down the street, but I called the police anyways. When they arrived, I told them all I could, and this was thankfully enough to keep the man away, because I never saw him again. I am uncomfortable sharing certain details about my story, so I will be purposely vague. This story happened back when I was in middle school. Against my wishes, my mom enrolled me into an after-school program called ELP, which stands for Extended Learning Program. I already hated school, and being forced to stay there for an extra hour pissed me off. I would usually get out at 4, but with the program, I was there until 5. I did well in school and I didn't really need the extra time. My only guess is that my parents wanted me out of the house for another hour. My house was a short walk from the school, so I would usually be back by 5.20 at the latest. On the day in question, a huge storm passed through our town during the school day. When 5 o'clock rolled around, there was still an overcast in the sky, which made things darker than usual. As soon as I left the school grounds, I noticed this old station wagon moving slowly down the street toward me. Maybe it was just a confused grandmother of one of the students, unsure of where the drop-off was. I simply ignored it and continued on. It wasn't until I was a block down the road that I realized the vehicle was tailing me. I looked behind me to see something truly terrifying. Behind the wheel of the car was someone wearing a white mask with a creepy-ass smiley face on it. I should have taken off on foot, but instead I just stood there like an idiot as the car approached me. Soon, the wagon came to a stop next to me. I looked directly at the driver's creepy mask before a muffled voice spoke to me. Hi. I didn't respond. Need a ride, kid? I looked to the ground and shook my head. When I looked back, I was horrified to see that the driver was now pointing a gun at me. I took a few steps back. The driver then squeezed the trigger, and I heard a click. Bang! You're dead. The wagon then took off down the street. I stood there in total shock. Some jackass thought it was funny to point a gun at a 14-year-old kid. I ran home and immediately told my parents about what happened to me. The police were called. They ended up arresting the man a couple of hours later outside of a grocery store. Apparently he suffered from schizophrenia and was off of his meds. The gun he pointed at me was real, but was not loaded. Needless to say, he was locked up indefinitely. We're going back almost 10 years ago now. But one morning I dropped my son off at school and then drove over to a nearby 7-Eleven with my infant daughter. It was pretty early in the morning so there were only one or two other customers and one of them was this older looking guy with a walker who was slowly making his way around the store. I didn't pay him too much attention other than feeling kind of sorry for him. Then I picked up the few items I needed then headed out to my car. Right as I'm putting my daughter in her car seat I hear a voice behind me. I turn, and it's the old man with the walker, only there's something weirdly different about him than when I saw him in the 7-Eleven. He was walking upright, not leaning on the walker, and his voice sounded much younger than you would have expected from just looking at him. I remember all he said was, cute kid. Then as I turned around, I only got the slightest look at the guy and his brand new posture before he slammed the walker into the back of my legs. The force made my knees buckle, and I almost fell right on top of my young daughter. I'm not exactly the tallest woman in the world, so the height reduction from my knees buckling had me falling forward into my open car door, 
and I had really tried not to crush her as I fell. I honestly thought that he was trying to get me, which was bad enough. But when he grabbed me by the hair and started to drag me up and off of my daughter, I realized he was trying to get to her instead. I honestly didn't think that I could get any more terrified, but the realization that he was actually trying to take my infant daughter away from me was just too much to bear. I remember letting out the loudest, most ear-splitting scream I've ever let out in my life, begging him not to take my baby. He was so much stronger and faster than he looked, and I guess that was all part of his fiendish scheme to have everyone let their guards down around him. It honestly seems like divine intervention now that I look back at it. But someone was just pulling into the small parking lot just as he almost had a hand on my daughter, and seeing the struggle had them instinctively honking their horn over and over in a bid to break it up. I think they figured it was just an incident of spousal abuse or something because they were just honking and didn't get out of their car until I screamed over and over again, he's trying to take my baby. The moment they heard that, they came bursting out of their driver's side door, but then the guy sprinted past the passenger side and out towards the main highway. The second he did, another car comes speeding up and stops by him, which I first thought might have been another person coming to tackle him or something, but instead, the guy climbs into the second car and speeds off with a screech of his tires. What horrified me in the aftermath was that it was quite clearly a well-planned an almost perfectly executed attempt to kidnap my daughter, and I wouldn't be surprised in the least bit if it had worked on a previous occasion. After the kind stranger calmed me down, they helped me call the cops as I tried my best to calm my daughter down in turn. She was still too young to really know what was going on, but she picked up on my distress enough to be wailing and crying until I managed to lull her off to sleep. The cops who arrived at the 7-Eleven a short while after said that They'd never heard of such a thing happening there before, but they were able to check the street cameras outside the 7-Eleven to try and get a clear image of the getaway car's number plate. I stuck around long enough to find out that the car's plates came back as stolen, and the cop I spoke to said that there was a good chance that they just ditched the vehicle somewhere after wiping it down for prints. If they had already planned such a detailed operation out, there was a good chance they planned for that too. The only saving grace was that the officer assured me that my report was a step towards catching them. A small step, but a step nonetheless. The horrifying experience I went through that morning wasn't for nothing, as not only did the cops now have a description of the guy who tried to do the kidnapping, but their failure to kidnap my daughter meant that they'd probably hesitate before trying the same plan again. I took a lot of comfort in that idea, and if it wasn't for the cop taking the time to reassure me of that, I don't think I'd have dealt with the trauma of it as half as well as I did in the months that followed. But I did a lot of praying, too. Desperate prayers that whoever had planned such a horrifying kidnap would never, ever be successful. And that no one else would have to endure the pure horror that I had. This story happened to my brother, and is told from his perspective. On Halloween of 2017, I went trick-or-treating with my friends who I'll call Harvey, Michael, and Daniel. We were all around 14 to 15 years old and really just wanted to make the most of Halloween as we had so much homework starting the 10th grade and we probably would never be able to trick-or-treat again. Anyway, we were all walking down this random street at like 9.30 when we saw one house with insane over-the-top Halloween decorations that looked like it cost up to about $500. The four of us walked up to the house and rang the bell. Some 50-year-old looking man opened the door and said, no need to yell, just come on in and you'll get your sweets. Daniel told the guy, well, asked the guy, can you just bring the candy out here? The guy didn't even answer. And so the four of us just walked away, not saying a single word. But of course, this story wouldn't be scary if it didn't end here. We were walking down my street when Harvey pointed out, Guys, that man is following us. We all looked out behind us and saw the same 50-year-old looking man walking about 25 feet behind us. The four of us bolted all the way to the house. We ran to my house. We thrust open the front door entered my house and locked the door. The four of us were just hyperventilating as if we just ran an ultra marathon. 
I was starting to settle down when Jason said, Look at the window. We all looked, and there he was. The old man looking through one of my windows. My parents were on a vacation, and my brother was at his friend's Halloween party, so we couldn't tell them. But what really made this horrifying was that I could see this guy holding a gun in his hand. I yelled at my friends, and we ran upstairs to call the police. The officers arrived in about 10 minutes. The man wasn't on my property anymore, but we remembered the house, so that's where we went. The cops went there, searched the whole place, and came out with the man in chains. It turned out the house was vacant, and the man was a serial killer who escaped from prison a month ago. If my friends and I are able to go trick-or-treating again, we're avoiding the street that this house was on. And who knows what that guy was really going to do if we went in. I'm glad this happened when we were teenagers and not when we were 9 years old. All I can say is if you're trick-or-treating, make sure that the house owner is completely normal. It was the summer of 2014. I was 15 years old. I was staying at my friend George's house for the night. This was a common occurrence and I used to stay over there sometimes more than two to three times a week during the summer. After all, he was my best friend and we were kids so it was completely normal. George and his parents had lots of property behind their house. Probably like seven to eight acres, maybe more honestly. They had a huge barn, a cornfield, and some really cool trails in the woods we used to ride our dirt bikes and four wheelers in. I felt like a bad friend for this, but I didn't even know it was his birthday when I got there. After people started showing up and like more of his friends and family, I realized that he did tell me that today was his birthday a few weeks back. Oh man, I thought. I didn't get him a present. I immediately apologized to him and he took it very well. As a matter of fact, he told me he didn't want any birthday presents from his friends this year and that he wasn't expecting anything because of how good his parents spoiled him this year. That made me feel better, but I still felt guilty. We did everything that you would normally do for a 15 year old's birthday party. We had cake, open presents, and us kids spent some time playing outside with his new airsoft guns that he got for his birthday. He already had quite the collection of them, so we all had our own that we could play with. I won't go too deep into this part, but we decided we wanted to do teams. It was me, George, and Will. The other team had Evan, Scott, John, and Kyle. They had more people, but we had better guns. The whole gist of the game was to shoot them before we get shot. So we were all running around the trails frantically, trying to get the other team down before they got us. After quite a few games, and skip forward two hours or so, it was around 6.30, so the sun was starting to set. George and I agreed we should all go back inside and play some video games before everyone had to leave. But everyone else wanted to keep playing with the airsoft guns outside. Even though it was George's birthday, he was nice enough to let everyone vote on what we should do. It was apparent that we were going to be playing outside longer according to the votes, so that's what we did. We restarted the game, and we all had about two minutes to get set up and hide where we wanted to. George yelled, three, two, one, go. This time George and I were alone. We were pretty deep into the trails at this point, and he had me following him deeper into the woods. We ran all the way to this tree house that was built a long time ago. We climbed up there immediately. Are you sure they will even come back this far? I asked George. I mean, it's getting dark, and I doubt they would even think that we would go this far. Yeah, they probably won't, he said, but if they do, they won't be able to get us before we get them. And plus, it will be funny if they can't find us. As time went on, it got darker. Hey, George, we should probably go home. Just a few more minutes, he said. After all, it was his birthday, so I wanted to do what he wanted. Shh, do you hear that, George whispered? There was someone, or something walking quite close to us. We thought it was them, but we heard our friends yelling and talking further out into the distance, so we immediately ruled them out. Unless they were splitting up and trying to trick us, I whispered. Um, no. No offense to them, but none of them are smart enough to think of that, George said. Jeez, harsh, I said. He looked at me and kind of shrugged, and then he put his finger up to his mouth and said, Shh. Whatever was approaching us was getting closer. After a few moments of being quiet, we could finally see the tall, slender-looking shadow that stood before us. I don't think they can see us, I whispered. Shh, George said. Yeah, it definitely wasn't any one of our friends, because whatever it was, was the size of a fully grown man, and not a teenager. We stayed put, as quiet as possible. 
Thankfully, it was dark because from where the person was standing, it was evident they couldn't see us. The person started walking in the opposite direction now. The last bit of light that shined into the woods ever so lightly shined directly at the unknown person. They were wearing some sort of ghillie suit, it looked like. George took no chances and jumped down as soon as the strange figure was out of sight. What are you, crazy? I asked. He insisted I follow, so I did. I was scared, but I would have been more scared by myself, so that's why I went with him. We immediately ran a different way than the way we used to get there. He said he knew a better way back to the house, and that there was a way through the cornfield that was parallel to the trails we were in. Almost immediately after jumping out of the treehouse, though, the thing in what looked like a ghillie suit, who we assumed to be a weird man, heard us and started running towards us. We had a bit of distance between us and him, and it was a good thing we were way faster because I don't know what would have happened to us or one of us had us not have been faster. We ran screaming the whole way back. Our friends must have realized that we weren't joking because they also started running towards us and made their way to us only a minute or two later. We all made it to my backyard and my dad must have heard us because he ran out with no shoes on at all to our rescue. George and I told him everything. My dad immediately called the police, but there wasn't much they could do since they couldn't find the men and since I couldn't give a description. The only thing I can really say is, I will never be going back out into those trails ever again, and I highly doubt George will either. This took place like 10 years ago. I was staying at Alex's house, who was my best friend at the time. It was just your average weekend of playing with Nerf guns, eating pizza, and drinking Mountain Dew while playing Call of Duty and Halo on Xbox Live all night. You know, pretty much what every kid did back in 2012. This is more of a mysterious kind of story, and I'm certain that most of the people I've told either think it's made up or that I'm crazy. But my friends and I know it's true. Ever since this night, I've 100% believed that there is such thing as the paranormal, or whatever you want to call it. But you know what I'm talking about. Like ghosts, demons, maybe not that exactly, but something bad and extremely disturbing. Something that we as humans can't comprehend yet. So we were upstairs in Alex's room, just me, him, and Sebastian. We were just having fun taking turns playing Halo and Call of Duty, since there were three of us and he only had two controllers. All of a sudden, Alex muted the TV and got us all to be quiet. Immediately, we all heard what sounded like someone screaming at the top of their lungs, like I have never heard before. It was a very demented, wailing sound that Alex said he hears sometimes. Keep in mind, it was one o'clock in the morning, on a dead-end street that only had one street light post on it. With a very small amount of light that we had to work with, we saw this silhouette of a super tall being sprinting like a deer across the street. The wailing sound diminished slowly as it got further away from us. What the heck was that, Alex? It's a ghost, he said. What do you mean a ghost? Come on, you saw that too. Now if you can sit here and lie to yourself and say that was a human or some sort of animal species that isn't known to man yet, then go ahead. But clearly that thing was no animal, and it definitely was not a human being. I don't know what it is. My guess is as good as yours. By this time, the strange skinwalker looking thing has completely vanished out of sight, and we couldn't hear anymore. Alex kept staring out the window though. He looked like he was about to go insane. Alex, hey bud, you okay? You should probably sit down and drink some water. He then started to cry. I guess the emotions of all this got to him and he couldn't control it so he started having a breakdown. Apparently this has been happening to him for years now and he doesn't know what to do and that no one else has seen it besides us three that he knows of. And that his parents won't believe him and that they think he's crazy. I think he was happy that after all these years someone else actually saw what he was talking about. Of course he didn't want us to see it because it traumatized us as well, but I think it gave him some sort of comfort knowing that it was real and he's not crazy. But maybe even more discomfort though, because knowing that it's real is downright terrifying. Apparently he still hears it from time to time, but he has chosen to completely ignore it. Growing up, I had to get used to my dad pranking me, which is why, when he called me to tell me not to answer the front door as I was watching TV, I thought he was just messing with me. My phone rang, and that was the first thing he said, don't answer the door. I froze for a moment, 
but then began to laugh because I assumed he was just trying to freak me out. But when the doorbell rang, it got increasingly more serious. My dad must have heard the bell on the other side because he very firmly said, Don't go to the door. I asked him what was going on because I could tell how serious he was being. And he told me that he wasn't sure, but the police were on their way. I was both shaking with fear, but very curious as to what was going on. The doorbell rang again, and I figured I could peek out the window and see who was there. I leaned over my couch and slowly moved the curtain out of the way, and my dad must have heard me gasp because all he said was, Hey, you're gonna be okay. The police will be there soon. Just don't answer the door. And I wish that made me feel better. But outside my house, there were at least three men, all dressed up in clown clothing and carrying what looked like weapons. I could see two of them standing on my porch, while another was walking around my yard. I told my dad that I was scared, and that was when the ringing of the doorbell turned to slamming on the door. I couldn't tell if they were knocking really hard or trying to kick it down. I began to panic, and as I turned away from the window that was facing the front of my house, I screamed, standing on the other side of my house with his face pressed against the window was the third clown. He waved his hand slowly as we made eye contact. The slamming at the front door grew louder and louder, and my dad tried to calm me down, though he knew there was little to be done until the police arrived. Thankfully, I could hear the sound of sirens in the distance. Sadly, so did the men trying to break in. The three of them quickly ran off my property and down the road away from the sirens. Once the police arrived, I unlocked the door and let them in. We explained everything to them, and they let us know that we weren't the only call that they had gotten like this in the past few months. Apparently, these three had been terrorizing people in the surrounding area for a few months before I had a run-in with them. A few years ago, During my sophomore year of college, I suddenly had to switch dorms due to housing and residence life at my university being completely awful to me and a few other student workers. Long story short, I lost my job and I actually had to move within a day. My parents came five states away and made a huge fuss in the housing office so that I was able to get more moving time. This is really important later in the story. I used to go on Instagram live a lot because I'm a music minor and practicing in front of an audience really helps me improve my piano skills. I guess Instagram had begun offering the feature of showing stories and lives on the explore page, so I ended up getting a lot of views and comments from strangers. Nothing too bad. It was usually just song requests that I couldn't fulfill because I had a strict repertoire from my piano professor or hard eyes from strangers. I used to really enjoy the lives until I got a comment from a man who knew exactly the location of my university. I never wore any kind of school attire during my lives or publicized my location on Instagram, so it made me a little nervous. I stopped doing lives after that for a while, getting caught up in regular work and figured everything was fine. The guy sent me a few messages offering to take me on a date. A quick scan of his profile made it clear that he was at least 50 years old. He worked as a laborer for the city my university is located near. He asked me several times a day what buildings my classes were in, if I liked the cafeteria, etc. Until I finally got scared and decided to block him. However, before I blocked him, I called him a pervert and a freaking weirdo for being so interested in me when I was so much younger than him. And for also trying to find me when I was trying to go to class. A few weeks later, after I had forgotten about his weird messages, I got a message from him saying something along the lines of, I waited for you in front of your old dorm for hours, but you never showed. Did you go home for the weekend? You shouldn't be so rude to me next time, or else we won't have fun whenever we meet face to face. That message scared me more than I'd ever been scared in my life. One of my really close friends graduated from the university and began working as a campus police officer around the same time that this all happened. So I decided to go see her and see what I could do. 
Sadly, not much could really be done about it, but I definitely pulled back on my social media presence. The guy had followed me from two more Instagram accounts with different usernames, and I blocked all of them before he could even message me. Thankfully, since leaving after that spring semester, I haven't heard from him since. So to the creepy old guy from Instagram that wouldn't leave me alone, I really hope I don't hear from you ever again. When I was in the 8th to 10th grade, I was extremely involved in this small building server. The average age was probably about 15 to 17, and I joined a group of builders and Skype with them every weekend for like hours. We all became close fast, and we trusted each other. Enough that we actually followed each other on Instagram. I became particularly close with one of the builders in my friend group named Peter. Peter was in the same grade as me, and we ended up texting quite a lot. I had heard some rumors that Peter might have a crush on me, which he denied, which I kind of found laughable because, I mean, it was the internet, and I just brushed it off. Everything was fine for a while, until something began to feel really off whenever I talked to him. I was starting to constantly catch him telling these small lies. This really bothered me, so I figured it was time to distance myself from him and just stop talking to him altogether. Cut to a few months later of no contact, and Peter out of the blue sends me a text that he's going to be possibly transferring to my high school. He said he was doing this so he can get in-state tuition for college. Peter's plan was to somehow live completely alone and support himself while in high school. My stomach dropped when I read that text and I just felt really off. I try to be calm, but also tell him that his plan is crazy. I tell him that it's oddly convenient that he chose my random suburb of all places. Peter just insists that his plan will work out, and it's really just a coincidence that he's going to my high school. I'm trying to call Peter's bluff, hoping he's just screwing with me because I cut him off. Peter then says that he's already bought the plane tickets, and he's going to stay in my town to go visit some high schools in the area. Fear washes over me. I begin to realize that Peter definitely has some really weird unhealthy attachment to me. Peter wasn't bluffing. To my horror, he posts a picture on Snapchat at the airport. Peter asked me to meet him up while he's there, but of course I decline. Later on, I see on his Snapchat story that he's actually taking a tour of my high school. He takes lots of videos and pictures, and I'm probably hoping I can see it. Luckily for me, I'm actually stuck home with pneumonia. I spend the next few days totally on edge and totally afraid that he was going to ring my doorbell at any moment. Luckily, he wasn't smart enough to find where I live, and he flies home and doesn't even follow his plan. The most baffling part? None of my old group on the Minecraft server even thought he was doing anything creepy. I honestly felt like I was going crazy for even thinking this was weird. I thought that my rejection for this meetup would be the end of it. But about two years later, I had just committed to my dream college. I still stupidly followed Peter on social media because I wanted some kind of warning if he was coming to my area again. Once again, Peter did. I see him posing right in front of the library at my college with the caption saying, Transferring here is definitely the move. Cut to a few months later and Peter finds out that I had a boyfriend now and he directly contacts me for the first time in like two years. He starts asking me strange questions like, Is he going to protect you? I shouldn't have answered, but for some reason I did. I finally blocked him and out of fear, I decided to stop following him on social media. He hasn't tried to contact me since. After work, I like to go with co-workers to Waffle House sometimes. It's fun, relaxing, and relatively cheap. However, tonight I decided to go out with a couple of girls I work with. I don't have a vagina myself, but since we all closed up together, we thought we would go grab something to eat. So while we're eating, I'm facing the door, and in walk these two drugged out looking people, which isn't uncommon for Waffle House. But something about these two people in hoodies in the middle of summer in Texas really put me on edge. The two girls I was with were both pretty attractive, and the two guys also took note as they walked past. 
I've been in a couple of sticky situations and can always tell when shit is about to go down, and these guys gave off that vibe like no other. They sat behind me where I couldn't see them in any reflection. It was nerve-wracking. A few minutes went by before I realized that it was just our two groups in the restaurant. I glanced over my shoulder and saw they weren't eating anything, just drinking and staring at us. Fuck. I told the two girls I was with that we should try to hurry up and go because I was tired, trying not to freak them out, because assholes like those guys feed on fear. We got up, and I look over at them. They were still watching us with empty drinks now. At this point, I should say two things. I have an injured knee right now from practice that causes me to limp a little, and I train in Muay Thai boxing and compete internationally in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I am not one to be fucked with, but the limp definitely gives off the impression that I would be easy to overpower. So as we were paying, I noticed one of the guys point at me and make a stabbing motion, and the other guy smiled, and they both stood up and walked towards us. One of the girls I was with was making sexual passes at me, which were very visual. I told her to stop as these guys got closer, and I saw one lick his lips as the other held one hand in his pocket. I told the hostess to keep the change and hurried the girls outside while trying to hide my limp as best I could. We got to the parking lot and I told one girl to go to her car and gave the other the keys to my car and told them to hurry up and get in since I couldn't run with my limp and that I would explain later. The guys came out as I was getting in my car and I saw one of them pulling something out of his pocket and heard him yell something I couldn't make out over the sound of us noping the fuck out of there. I texted the girl who I wasn't taking home and explained the situation and why I was acting weird. I hate to think about what could have happened if I had not been paying attention to my surroundings. Bad shit almost went down because of, I'm assuming, crackheads at Waffle House. Over the last seven months, I've been working for someone I responded to on Craigslist well, I'll just explain everything. This seems like an appropriate place to post this. I was scouring the internet for some sort of paying gig. I didn't really care what. Then I came across a post on Craigslist. I had refreshed the page and there it was. Someone was looking for a person to come by and feed their pets. I assumed they were going out of town or something. So I contacted them and left my number through email. I got a response immediately in the form of a phone call. The caller was a man who explained to me that he was moving out of town and his parents had cats they wanted fed daily. I gave the man my name so he could run me through a cursory background check and in about 20 minutes I was hired. I went there the next morning to get all the instructions and whatnot and met the man I spoken to on the phone. His name was Ben. Ben explained to me that he could no longer be able to care for his parents' cats and that his parents needed to focus on themselves so I was being brought in to take care of that. The money would be left on the kitchen table at the end of every week, $200 a week, just to feed some cats, I know, right? In addition to that, money for more cat food would be left for me as needed. Then, he told me the first thing that I thought was strange. I was to come at exactly 10 a.m. every day and be gone by 10, 10 a.m. And I was never, under any circumstances, to interact with his parents. He told me that when I'm in their home, they will be in their chairs in the living room watching television and that I was not to disturb them, ever. He asked if any of that would be a problem, to which I assured him it wouldn't. He then showed me the area in which the cats eat. There were four cats and where the food was kept. Well, not rude in the least, he was very adamant that I not explore further in the house, to which I assured him it wouldn't be a problem. He ushered me outside and showed me where the spare key was in case the door was ever locked but he told me that was very unlikely to happen, and with that he expressed his hope that I could be trusted one last time, shook my hand, and told me to be there at 10 a.m. every day starting tomorrow. If I was ever unable to make it, call and leave a message on their home phone, to which he gave me the number. I shook my head and was on my way. The next day came and I went inside at exactly 10 a.m. I walked into the house and immediately to my right were Ben's parents, sitting in recliners, facing away from me, watching some kind of game show. I announced my presence, which they ignored, and made my way to the kitchen. I fed the cats bowls and left. The exact same scenario played out countless times over the next few months. 10am, unreturned hello, feed the cats, leave. 
On Fridays, I would pick up the small stack of $20 bills from the kitchen table. It was the easiest job I ever had. Then came the inevitable. One day, I was running late. I got to the house at 10.08. I entered and apologized to Ben's parents for being late, to which I once again got no response. They just kept sitting in their chairs watching their game show. I went to the kitchen and fed the cats. I looked at my phone, which read 10.11, and walked down the hall towards the front door. When I reached the living room, I jumped and gasped out of shock. Ben's parents were now standing in the dark behind their chairs, completely still, staring directly at me. I apologized for running late and got out of there. Though unnerved, I went back the next day on time and everything was fine. A few more months went by of nothing strange, and then came the last day I was there. I got there at 10.03, but wasn't worried because I knew I could be out before 10.10. The problem came when I was in the kitchen and I heard someone whisper the words, Help me. It startled me and I jumped, looking around for the source of the cry for help. I saw no one around, but I heard it again, and then a third time. I began looking around before realizing I was running behind. I looked at my phone and it was 10.10. My heart sank to my stomach when I looked down the hallway and saw Ben's parents for the first time in the light. They were grossly emaciated and pale, looking completely malnourished. They were essentially walking skeletons. I apologized for taking so long and said I'd be on my way, but they just stood there, blocking the way to the front door. I said I would take the back door, which was located in the kitchen, but when I went to open it, it required a key to open from the inside, seriously. It was at this point that true panic set in. I looked behind me, and the parents were now about half a foot away from the entrance to the kitchen, and I had nowhere else to go except for what I presumed was a door to the pantry. They had blank stares across their faces, and their eyes looked as if the life had left them a long time ago. In a last-ditch effort, I went to the door that I thought was the pantry and found it led to a staircase leading into a basement with, of course, no light. As soon as I opened the door, there was a horrid stench that washed over the otherwise clean air I was standing in. I carefully went down the stairs and looked for a window, but they were all nailed shut. I happened to look back up the stairs, and the parents were now standing next to each other at the top of the hallway. It was truly horrifying. I pulled out my phone and called 911, not knowing what else to do. And when I explained my situation, they said they would send a car out immediately and to stay on the phone while they connected me to the unit en route. I ran into the dark basement using my phone as a light. It didn't provide too much illumination since I was in the middle of a call, but it was just enough. There were racks of junk that lined the basement, separating it into almost aisles. I went down to check if any of the windows were possibly loose, like I'd be that lucky. Then I turned the light around and shined the light in front of me and I was inches away from the parents' lifeless-looking faces. I let out a scream and ran in the other direction and tripped over something, sending my phone flying from my head. Of course, it landed face down so I couldn't find it. I ran back up the stairs and into the kitchen, looking back and seeing the parents standing at the bottom of the stairs with slight grins on their faces. I ran down the hall to the front door and flung it open, screaming when I saw the cop standing right in front of me. He asked me if I was the one that called as I pushed past him to get outside, and I told him I was. I looked in the window and saw the parents sitting in their chairs, watching their game show. I explained that these crazy old people had trapped me in their house and were chasing me around. The cop went in to talk to the parents and look around while I sat in the cop car. He came back out about five minutes later and asked if I was sure someone was chasing me. I said yes, I was absolutely sure that it was the two old people that lived there. He informed me that the people that lived there, the people in the chairs, have been dead for quite some time. I asked what the smell in the basement was, and he said there was another body down there. Backup showed up. I gave them my statement and explained how I'd been coming there every day for months and months to feed the cats. I told them to call Ben, the homeowner's son. I gave them the number and it was disconnected. I used to work at a Starbucks here in Cardiff, and I've got to be honest, it's one of the better jobs I've ever had. The manager was brilliant. The other staff were nice and looked out for each other, so for a minimum-ish wage job, it was about as good as it gets. The only bad shifts to work were the first halves of Monday and Tuesday mornings, as the pre-work rush meant people were often at their absolute worst. I mean, don't get me wrong, people could be complete jerks at other times of the day or week, but the highest concentration of them was Monday and Tuesday mornings, without a shadow of a doubt. But rude customers aren't scary. Annoying and frustrating, yes. Chillingly cruel and calculating, not as much. 
which is why this particular incident has stayed with me for so long and I always seem to use it as my personal point of reference for how terrible human beings can be to each other. So, it's a Monday morning and we're just coming to the end of the rush at around 9am. 30 minutes more and the caffeine fiends will start to thin out and we can get some coffee and make a smoke break of our own. I heard her before I saw her. Like, she was only just trying to get a handle on what had been pure harpy screeches just moments before. Some woman was on her phone, ranting away and not looking where she was going as she tries to find the back of the queue. In doing so, she cuts off this other bloke who politely informs her that she's queue jumping. I don't know if she actually didn't hear him or was just tactically ignoring him, but either way, this bloke has to tap her on the shoulder before saying, Excuse me, I believe I was ahead of you. The woman just shrugs this off at first, giving the guy a gesture like, I'm too busy to listen to you. I remember the look of anger on the guy's face as she gently but firmly grabs the strap of her handbag and tugs her out of the queue before taking her place. I'm a bit torn about the whole thing. Like, yeah, it was righteous, but laying hands on someone, I feel like there could have been a better way to resolve the issue. But it wasn't like the guy had picked her up and thrown her, and due to the size difference, that was definitely a possibility. Anyway, she reacts like this had been the case, like him actually standing up to her with some horrific incident of assault and starts demanding someone call the police, even though she herself was on the phone and simply refused to hang up. A couple of staff members and customers manage to calm the situation down, and we get the guy's coffee before one of my colleagues serves the angry woman. I didn't serve her, but when she got her order, she turns to be like, Um, excuse me, this coffee isn't as hot as I asked for. No, I know better than to just argue with customers and especially absolute whoppers like her. So I do as I'm asked and heat the coffee up a little bit more for her. I hand it back. She dips a finger in it and once again tells me, This coffee isn't hot enough. Now bearing in mind, she just watched me run some steam through it, but again, I do as I'm asked and give her back some literally steaming hot coffee that she proceeds to absolutely overload with sugar. No wonder she was in such a stinking mood. Her entire life was probably one big sugar crash, hence why she was such an unbearable person to be around. But little did I realize, that coffee wasn't for her. And on her way out of the store, she took the lid off of her scalding hot syrupy coffee and threw it in the guy's face as he sat reading his newspaper. God, the sound of that guy screaming was absolutely horrific. Like I didn't actually see the woman throw her coffee in the guy's face, so I thought someone had broken a leg or something. That's the only time I've heard someone scream in pain like that. When my old skating buddy absolutely shattered his leg on this visit to a Bristol skate park one year. But what followed in the coffee shop was pure chaos. People were pouring bottles of water onto this guy's face, ambulance staff and police turning up. I think the woman legged it as soon as she threw the coffee because... To my knowledge, no one was arrested, but the guy who had the coffee thrown on him suffered life-changing injuries. From what another colleague told me, the gross amount of sugar in the coffee meant that some of it actually stuck to his face like a kind of molten hot glue. He'd been left with terrible scarring for the rest of his life, and all because he stood up to some absolute monster in the queue that morning. That's what I find really scary that some people out there are so unhinged that a seemingly normal interaction with them could end up with you suffering injuries you'll carry with you for the rest of your life. Just one moment of misjudgment, one little enough is enough moment, and boom, you're going to look at a very different version of yourself in the mirror for the rest of your natural life. I have a beach house in Florida that I tend to visit with my girlfriend on the colder months up north. In the warmer months, we'd still visit occasionally, but nowhere near as much, since there wasn't as much of a need to. It was early February, freezing up in Connecticut, so my girlfriend and I took a trip down to Florida to visit the beach house. By the time we actually got to the house, after a day and a half's drive, it was starting to get dark out. It was actually a long month and a half since I'd been there the last time. The electricity and water and everything was already on since it was the winter. 
and I kept everything on during the winter season due to our frequent visits. So all we had to do when we arrived to the house was unpack, take a couple of lounge chairs, and walk 20 seconds onto the beach to take a nap. We didn't even check out any of the other rooms because we were so drained. We lounged down on the beach until it got really dark. I felt my girlfriend's hand on my shoulder. I looked up at her and she asked if I left that light on. I turned to the house and saw one of the upstairs lights on. Not just that, but at one of the windows in that room, there was a shadow outline. I looked at my girlfriend and she looked at me, and I think it sunk into both of us that someone was in that room at that window. I told her to wait there, and I ran up to the house as fast as I could. When I got to the back doors, I started being really quiet. I slid it open and shut quietly. Being that I was barefoot, it made tiptoeing a bit easier. I made it to the stairway and then halfway up the stairs before I heard a door shut upstairs. I went up the remaining stairs a bit quicker now and saw that the door to the room that had the light on was open. But the lights were off now. I kept the lights off though. I just used the flashlight which I had in the shelf ledge upstairs. Then I noticed the closet door. It was shut. That must have been the door I heard closed. I figured I'd shut off the flashlight and tipped her to the door of the closet and I slowly put my ear up to it to listen. There was nothing but silence in the room and on the other side of the closet door. I wasn't sure what was going to happen when I opened that door. If someone was in fact on the other side, I had to confront this. I grabbed the two little knobs and finally brought myself to yank the doors open. But it was empty in there, or at least from what I could tell, it was dark. I grabbed my flashlight and switched it on again, and yep, the closet was empty. But a creak in the floorboards outside of the room caught my attention. I ran into the hall expecting to see the intruder, but no, it was just my girlfriend. I got mad at her for coming into the house, even though I told her not to. But now that she was there, I told her to help search the upstairs. We looked around in all three bedrooms upstairs, all the closets, and the bathroom, but there was no one. Then we checked the downstairs, every room, every closet, no one. We had to figure out who was in the house and how they managed to escape. So we locked all the doors and looked around the house for any signs of breaking and entering or stolen items, but there was neither of that. So we brushed up and went to bed since we were exhausted. However, that night before we could fall asleep, there was a click under our bed. I asked my girlfriend if she could hear. She said yes. I got out from under the bed and got down onto my knees. When my face got to the ground level, giving me a view of the underside of the bed, I could see the intruder lying under our bed. <laughs> I looked at him face to face before he crawled out and made a break for it. I couldn't catch him once he got outside because I was still barefoot. I also didn't get a very good look at his face because we only looked at each other for about a few seconds. We once again searched the whole house to see what he could have stolen, but surprisingly, nothing was stolen. This story happened when I was a freshman in high school. Back then, I used to ride to school every day on the bus and then take it home. I would usually be home by myself for a few hours until my parents got home from work. One day I got dropped off the same as always and walked to my house. I got to the front door and put the key in only to realize that it was already unlocked. I found this strange because it was usually always locked when I got home. We lived in a decently busy area, so we were always sure to lock our doors. As a high school kid, I got a little concerned from seeing this but I figured one of my parents just forgot to lock it. I went inside, and when I did, I got a slightly bad feeling. It was very quiet, and I slowly looked around the room. Everything looked normal and in place. I then thought I heard a noise of someone walking upstairs, but it was really hard to tell. It gave me a shiver down my spine, and I paused to listen more closely. When I did, I heard no more noises. The noises that I had heard were so brief and quiet that I figured I had to be just paranoid. I locked the doors and went into the kitchen. I made some pizza rolls and then went up to my room which was upstairs and watched some YouTube videos in my bed. After a few minutes of doing that, I got really tired and fell asleep. I woke up about 30 minutes later. When I did, I went back to watching YouTube until I heard the sound of my parents getting home a short time later. 
I then went downstairs and helped them unpack groceries which they had gotten. I was talking to my mom when I heard my dad shout from upstairs. He came down and said that my parents' bedroom was all messed up as if someone had torn through it. We all went upstairs to find the room was a complete mess. It was then that I remembered everything and told my parents about the door being left unlocked. They told me when they got home that I had left the door unlocked as well, but I know I had locked it. The police were called and came over to search the house. Nobody was found, but my parents did have several valuables stolen. I realized that I most likely was home with the intruder in the house and had taken a nap with them probably in the next room. It gave me the chills, and I'm very lucky that I didn't decide to look in my parents' room. kid, my parents used to go out of town for business all the time. I used to have to stay at my aunt's house when they were gone. But when I turned 13, my parents finally trusted me enough to stay home by myself. I was excited for this because I felt like I was being an adult living by myself for three days. My parents went over everything I needed and told me to lock all the doors and windows. When my parents left, I mainly watched TV and played video games. It was a Friday night so I stayed up pretty late, and at about two o'clock in the morning, I finally got sleepy and decided to go to bed. I went around the house making sure every window and door was locked, and then all the windows with blinds and shades I covered. Then I got ready for bed and turned out all the lights. I got in bed, closed my eyes, and tried to fall asleep. I was laying there for maybe two or three minutes when I heard the sound of a car slowly driving down our street. We lived in a very quiet neighborhood, and we were at the end of a street, so we didn't get much traffic often. I kept my eyes closed until I heard the car seemingly stop directly in front of our house. I heard the engine idling, but didn't hear the sound of a door opening or anything. After about a minute of this, I got curious, so I carefully, lo so I carefully raised my blinds and looked out. I could see there was a pickup truck parked right in front of our mailbox just sitting there with the engine running. I didn't recognize the truck, and I stayed watching it for a little while. Finally, I saw the door open and a man get out. He walked around the truck towards my yard. Our yard was pretty big. In fact, it was about five acres, and most of it was just woods that went from the side of our house all the way to the back and beyond our property. The man paced around a little bit, halfway in the street and halfway in our driveway. He seemed to be looking around. And then out of nowhere, he just walked into the side of my yard and into the woods. I started freaking out inside and wanted to call my parents. But with it being nearly three o'clock in the morning, I knew they would be sleeping. I considered the police, but I also thought maybe the man had a logical explanation. I feared the man was going to try to break into our house or something though. I got up and once again checked every door and window to make sure that it was locked. I then turned on every light in the house to make it look like there were people home. After that, I went back up to my room and locked the door. I peeked out of the window again. When I did, after just about 30 seconds, I heard noises coming from the woods. I was very careful to not let myself be seen from the window. I saw the man come out of the woods. He jogged towards his truck and got inside. Then the truck sped off rather fast. So fast, in fact, that I heard skid marks as it drove away. I was left with many questions. It took me a long time to fall asleep, and the rest of the weekend I was on edge. I'm happy to say that the man never came back, but I still wonder to this day what he was doing. This happened about 10 years ago. I was, I think, about 12 or 13 at the time. One night on a Friday after I got home from school, my parents told me they were going to dinner with some friends. That meant I would be home alone for the night. I was the only child and my parents would occasionally leave me alone. I always enjoyed it because I felt cool and grown up to have the whole house to myself. I asked my parents if I could have my friend Ryan over and he came over a little bit later. We played some basketball and then my parents left. Me and Ryan played some video games for a few hours after that 
and then he left to go home. I stayed in my room playing Madden on my PlayStation. About 20 minutes later, I thought I heard a noise coming from downstairs. It was now around 9 p.m., so I assumed it was my parents and I thought nothing of it. However, not too long after that, I got a call from my mom on the phone and she told me that they wouldn't be home for about another hour. Still, I had forgotten about the noise at that point and I kept playing video games. That is, until out of the corner of my eye, I was sure I saw somebody walk past my bedroom and down the hall. I had my bedroom door open only about a foot or two, but I was sure I had seen somebody walk by. I tried to convince myself that it was just our cat or something, but suddenly I got really creeped out and I wasn't feeling safe in my bedroom anymore. I wanted to get out of the house, but I was afraid of what I had seen. I waited in silence to see if I could hear anything else but there was no noise. Then I heard the floor creak at the end of the hall past my bedroom. My door didn't have a lock on it and was on the second floor, so I felt if I made a run for it, I would be able to safely get downstairs and outside. I just didn't know who or what was at the end of my hallway. I was too scared to make any noise or look down the hall. I just sat there in my chair, staring at the crack in my door to see if whoever was there would walk by again. After a couple of minutes, I finally got enough courage to walk over to the door. I did it as quietly as possible and then stood next to the door and listened. I didn't hear anything, so I decided that on the count of three, I would quickly walk out of my room and down the stairs as quietly as possible and then go out of my house. I took a deep breath and quickly left my room, but as I did, I guess that my curiosity got the better of me and I looked to the end of the hallway. I saw a dirty woman with really messy hair crouch down against the wall with her hands over her face. As soon as she saw me, she started to scream. I was more than freaked out and I ran as fast as I could down the stairs and out the front door. As I did, I heard her screaming getting louder and louder. When I got outside, I immediately took out my phone and called my parents. They told me to call the police, so I did and then I ran to Ryan's house, which was about five minutes away. My parents picked me up from Ryan's, and then we all went back to my house where we saw multiple police cars with flashing lights as well as an ambulance. I had to talk to the police, and my parents did for a while too. I guess when Ryan left out the front door, he left it open, and a lady that was messed up on drugs walked right in. It was something I will never forget. There are two types of people who work at McDonald's, or fast food places in general. There are ambitious, intelligent people who are trying to work hard to achieve a goal, in the hopes that one day they'll be able to quit for the sake of something better. And then there are the losers, those with no ambition who have given up and have no desire to achieve anything other than a weekly paycheck. I like to consider myself in the first category. As I was working hard to afford my apartment while taking classes at the local community college, I normally work the later shifts at the drive through window, which is the one spot most employees hated working the most. You constantly have to deal with extremely impatient, oftentimes very rude people who are on their phones or have music blaring, and oftentimes don't realize that I wasn't the individual who took their order, so it's not my fault if it's wrong. In addition to that, you're pretty much constantly on your feet and exposed to the elements. No matter how cold, windy, or rainy it is, you have to keep leaning out into it wishing that you were in a warm car about to drive away from this place. My point being, is please try to be more kind and patient with the drive through people. Yeah, some are lazy, but most are trying their best, and even though you only see them for about half a minute, a kind remark or a warm smile might make their day. Anyways, now that I've gotten that off my chest, I work the late shift with two people who I believe qualify for the second category of employees. Connie was a high school dropout who was almost always late and was never invested in what she was doing and Harold was a deadbeat who often smelled like weed and only kept the job because otherwise his parents would throw him out of the house. He was 32 years old. 
So one night I was there after 11 p.m. by the drive through window on an extremely cold January night, flipping through the pages of my class notes and trying to keep warm by the fry machine. Connie was mopping while looking at her phone, and Harold was in the back probably getting baked in the walk-in cooler. That late at night, we rarely got customers, and if we did, they were almost always zonked out college kids who used the drive through but never physically walked into the restaurant. I stood up and stretched my legs and told Connie that I was heading to the bathroom. It was around 11.30 at this point. I came back less than five minutes later, with Connie more or less in the same spot that she was before. I walked past her and turned the corner to return to the window and froze dead in my tracks. There was a bald man in white face makeup and a black hoodie standing directly outside the window staring in. His eyes were wide, with a blank expression that read, What kind of trouble can I create? The figure made direct eye contact with me and smirked, and slammed his palm against the window. I had no idea what to do, and inside my head, the words, Clown, Mime, Psychopath, Danger, and Death, all exploded like fireworks. The window was already shut and locked to protect myself from the cold, but the doors were all unlocked, and this person could easily walk right in and grab any one of us if he wanted to. In my head, I kept referring to it as he, but honestly, I had no idea what the gender was. The outfit and makeup made the stranger look androgynous. Maybe that was the point. The figure slapped on the glass window again with its hand. Open. Drawing out the word like a snake. Now, even if the figure wasn't dressed like that, I was under no obligation to open the window. It's unlawful to serve walk-ups at the drive through window, certainly for their safety, but also for ours. I shook my head and backed away. I called over my shoulder. Lock the doors. The whole time, this figure didn't break eye contact with me, and to the best of my memory, I don't even remember it blinking. It drew back its lips in a sinister smile, and I shit you not, its gums were black. I don't mean I was too far away that I couldn't see clearly. I mean its gums were as black as licorice. Oh, Ben. It hissed again, louder this time. Its other hand slammed against the window, and it licked its lips with its tongue. Oh, Ben. That's when a third hand slammed itself into the window. A left hand and it was just as pale and as skeletal as the other two. I lost my shit. Holy shit! Call the cops! I screamed and ran back into the office, which was the only room with a locking door and no windows. I heard Connie scream, What the fuck? And she dropped her mop and flew across the room and made for the back with me. All the yelling attracted Harold, and I shoved past him into the office and told him to look at the security camera. Sure enough, the white-faced creeper looked to have three hands on the window and was tilting its head back and forth, perhaps trying to discover where I ran off to. We locked the office door and called the cops, explaining to the operator that there was at least two prowlers outside acting in a threatening manner towards us. I kind of expected it to be over after I called the cops. If it was a prank, they would run once they realized they scared me enough to call 911. But it didn't end there. We watched as the figure left the drive through window, circled the building, and made for the restaurant door. Is there a second one? Look for a second one! I panicked while still on the phone with the operator. Connie was freaking out, and Harold was muttering something about not getting the police involved, likely because he was carrying weed. That's when the power went out. Everything. Cameras, lights, phone. The whole building went down and barely 10 seconds after we all quieted down after shouting at each other in the dark, we heard footsteps in the dining room area. Connie, did you lock the doors? I whispered. She didn't reply. I think she had her hand pressed over her mouth. Oh, Ben. We heard a voice call from outside the room in the dark. Oh, Ben. The shout came at least three more times. Circling from the kitchen to right off the hallway where we were hiding, I was convinced I was about to die, and every decision I had made in my life that brought me there was flashing before my eyes. We heard footsteps pass the office. After another few minutes, we heard the wail of police sirens outside, and at any moment, we expected to hear gunfire and the police shouting at someone to get on the ground, but we never did. 
We waited until the police identified themselves and opened the door and ran out into the parking lot. Since the power was down, we couldn't show the cops the security footage, so we just told them what we saw. They swept the whole building and said it was clear. The owner of that particular franchise store showed up about an hour later, after Harold and Connie had left. I waited for the power to be restored, so an officer could escort me back inside to collect my belongings. The next day my manager called me and asked me to work the night shift. I asked him if the creep from last night had been caught, when he said, There was no creep. I told him I quit and hung up the phone. This story is completely true. I have no idea what caused the power outage, which apparently erased all the security footage from the day. Without proof on video, my manager and the cops concluded that it was an elaborate prank, but that third hand still bothers me to this day, even more so than its hungry, inhuman eyes. Sure, it could have been a prank, but I wish someone would just confirm that for me, so I can sleep again. Keep your windows locked at night, and if you hear someone tapping from behind the curtains, don't open them. I'm 20 years old and I live in Canada. This story took place during the 2016 clown craze in October, about 10 to 20 minutes before my subway store was going to close. To make things a little easier to understand, I've got to give a brief explanation of the layout of our store. So there's the front door that customers walk through, which is completely made of glass. Then there's the windows to the left, if you're standing behind the counter facing the front. The bathroom is beside the swinging door that employees use to get to the sandwich unit. This all began while I was finishing doing dishes in the back room. I was the only person there because they rarely had more than one employee for the closing shift, unless of course it was for training purposes. Really, only one employee is needed, even though it might not be a smart decision. There hadn't been any customers for a while, and I really had to go to the bathroom so I started making my way to the swinging door by the sandwich unit, when all of a sudden I heard the bell ding at the front door, indicating that a customer had entered. I was honestly a bit annoyed because I'd been putting off going to the bathroom for a long time, and obviously I can't leave someone unattended in the front store. Before I even turned around to take the person's order, and I know it's going to sound odd, but I heard the generic sound of a clown's nose honking. It sent shivers and goosebumps through my entire body as I hesitantly turned around to confirm what I had just heard. There was someone standing at the door with a bright orange afro and white face paint. Beyond that, they were dressed extremely casually, though in a plain green zip-up hoodie and black jeans, which almost made it creepier. They stared at me, and smiled from ear to ear. Before I could even think of doing anything, they gave me a sinister little wave before quickly running out of the store and around the left side window. I was frozen in place. I was wondering, was this really happening? Or better yet, why was this happening? I didn't know the clown craze reached my small town. I just stared at the window for what felt like 10 minutes. Once I came to, I ran to the front door and just locked it. There was no way I was letting anyone in, even if we weren't closed yet. But before I did, I poked my head around the corner to make sure that lunatic was gone for sure. Well, I didn't see anything. He was gone, I thought. I couldn't see him anywhere. The parking lot was empty save for my car. So I went back in the store and locked the doors, counting the seconds until the actual closing time was here but not 10 minutes until closing. A couple of cops were knocking at the door. I was nervous, yet relieved to see them. I immediately unlocked the doors and let them inside. Apparently, they were there to just ask me a few questions. They wanted to know if I had seen someone dressed with an orange afro and white makeup. Uh, yeah, I was excited to tell them that some creep was out there so that they could catch this guy. Well, they explained that someone called not too long ago, saying that they drove by and saw someone matching that description in the subway parking lot, kneeling behind a green sedan. 
they were holding a carving knife. My heart seemed to stop. That was my car. The psycho was waiting for me behind my car. If the cops hadn't scared him away by showing up, he'd still be out there. What would have happened if I walked out there alone at closing time? I was scared more than I'd ever been, but the cops offered to walk me to my car and even check it if I needed them to. I happily obliged. Then I got out of there and stayed the night with a family member nearby because after that horrific experience, I couldn't be alone. The clown craze was always hilarious in my eyes until something actually happened to me. There was just something horrifying about the contrast of the clown hair and makeup, along with normal everyday clothing. Better yet, what would have happened if I was already in the bathroom, defenseless and unaware? I'm so thankful I held it for as long as I did, and that some stranger drove by and saw this weirdo. I'm happy that I didn't find out what this lunatic was capable of. You can bet I don't work the closing shift at Subway anymore. After my first semester of university, the beginning of May, I decided to reward myself by getting tickets for a band I wanted to see. They weren't playing in my hometown, unfortunately, and the nearest venue that they were playing was in a small town six hours away by train. I had a friend who attended the university in the town who agreed to let me stay with her, so I figured that I would be fine to go up. I had never been to this town before, but having lived in larger cities my entire life, I often associate small town with safety. I declined my friend's offer to drive me to the concert, considering she was studying for finals, and I enjoy a good walk. The town was divided by a river, and across that river you had to go over one bridge then walk through a park on an island, then cross a second bridge to get back into town. To get to the first bridge from my friend's university, you had to walk down a nature trail. All this was perfectly lovely, as I did it at sunset. I had just emerged from my first winter in a rather harsher environment than I had grown up in, and the whole nature trail park combo was filled with joggers and children playing, and squirrels and everything that I had missed. This is only noteworthy in that I felt completely at ease with my route, but I was pretty distracted and didn't pay a whole lot of attention to exactly which path I had taken. The concert didn't let out until probably slightly past midnight. I got to the first bridge, crossed, and proceeded across the island to the second bridge. It was a nice night out and I was actually sort of enjoying myself in the warm spring air. That is, until I got to a hill I didn't remember walking over on the way there. I stopped at the base of it, feeling that something was off, but eventually attributing it to the fact that I had somehow forgotten an entire hill. How funny, I thought, as I walked up the mystery hill. All my thoughts ceased as I got to the top and found myself looking down the path into an empty carnival, and beyond that, the second bridge. Walking over a hill, I didn't see an entire carnival and I don't remember it, and this definitely left me on edge but I didn't really see any way around it. Literally, there was forests on either side, plus the bridge was right there. And besides, the carnival looked abandoned. So I start off down the other side of the hill into the creepy carnival, maintaining a quick pace, definitely on high alert. I kept my focus mainly on the bridge I was aiming for. I was most of the way through when I saw the people. I saw them from far enough away that I didn't jump, but I did stop dead in my tracks. They seemed pretty normal looking by their clothes and I was too far away to see their faces. They were sitting in whatever was available. Lemonade stands, immobile roller coasters, covered picnic tables. I didn't really know what to do about it and I'm not sure that there was much a better option available. But in the moment, feeling I had to do something, I started to walk forwards again. And as I did, I made eye contact with the first one of them I saw and held it as I walked through them. The man I had chosen to look at I remember very vividly, looking a lot like I imagined death would look like, a gaunt, drawn-out face with no expression of any type on it, sunken eyes that followed me as the rest of his body stayed still. From what I could tell, the rest did the same. I was terrified out of my wits, and for some reason, Making eye contact with this zombie of a man was the only thing that I felt was keeping me safe. 
I never broke eye contact with him until I reached the second bridge, so far as to opt to walk backwards down the trail. I turned and crossed the bridge at a sprint, and someone shouted behind me, which only prompted me to run faster. Now I mentioned that the route from the university to the bridge was a nature trail. This meant that it had no lights on it and was as black as the void, trees covering up the moon and making it impossible to see anything. I didn't care. I ran down the trail, tripping over who knows what, anything to put distance between me and the creepy carnival people. Eventually, I reached a patch of light at the edge of the university and stopped. There wasn't any noise anymore except for crickets and my own frantic breathing. If any had followed me, they hadn't done so for long. I managed to gather myself together and remember that I did in fact have a cell phone, which at that point I used to call my friend to have her meet me at a well-lit spot on campus populated by studying students. I told her what had happened and her eyes got really wide. As it turned out, unbeknownst to me, there were two trails through the park on the island, a north and a south one. I had taken the north one on the way there and accidentally taken the south one on the way back. She told me that people never, ever passed through the carnival at night as it was where the local meth addicts and gang members would hang out. They were unpredictable at best and, at their worst, well, muggings were the least of it. I had gotten off extremely lucky. So everything ended up being explainable but somehow that made it even worse. I didn't sleep well that night and when my friend offered to drive me to the train station across the river the following evening, I accepted. A few years ago, the summer after I graduated from high school, me and a few friends all met up at a carnival in a nearby city. It was a pretty popular event. It happened every year with all the normal games and rides you would expect. We got there and played some games and got food. We really did all the normal carnival stuff. We stayed there until night and then started to head back. We went back towards the entrance of the carnival and all said bye to each other. Then we went our separate ways. All the four of us had parked in different places. So after saying bye, I walked back into the carnival to the side where I had parked my car, which was a few blocks away. But as I was walking, I saw a man approach me. He was skinny and had a sort of scraggly beard. He appeared to be sort of young. He asked me if I was leaving and if I could give him a ride. This guy was looking pretty sketchy and I really didn't want to give a ride to someone I didn't know. So I told the man that I didn't have a car. Of course, that wasn't true, but I just wanted him to leave me alone. The man looked disappointed and nodded his head and walked away. Then I walked to my car, which took me about 15 minutes to get there. I unlocked the doors as I got close to it, but at that same time, I heard rapid footsteps on the street coming out of nowhere. I looked and I saw the man. I had no idea he had been following me, and at this time on the street I was parked on, there was no one else around at all. The man said to me, Oh, you don't have a car, huh? In a pretty angry voice. I didn't say anything. I was pretty scared, and I couldn't believe what was happening. I then tried to get in my car quickly, but the man ran at me. He blocked the door to my car, and he demanded the keys. He claimed he could hurt me, so I just tossed the keys at him and ran away. He took the keys and drove off in my car. After he was gone, I called the police, and then called one of my friends who drove over and waited until the police arrived. I was pretty shaken up, and the police took down all the information I could give them before my friend Alex gave me a ride home. The car ended up being recovered a few days later, and the man was eventually caught as well. One day when I was a junior in high school, the bell had just rung, and I was on my way to art class. It was on the furthest end of the school, so I was walking pretty quickly to get there in time. All of a sudden, an announcement came on the intercom. It was a secretary from the front desk of the school. Her voice was shaky as she announced that the school had just been placed on lockdown and everyone needed to get inside the room closest to them and follow lockdown procedures. Before hanging up, she said that this was not a drill. There was silence for a moment before total chaos erupted in the hallways. Everyone was running around and there were papers and books being scattered about. 
I was nearly to the art room at this point, so I ended up just sprinting there. When I got there, the room was bustling with people running in all different directions. After letting a few more people into the room, the teacher decided to close the door and lock it. We turned off the lights and then all gathered in the back of the classroom where we wouldn't be visible from the window in the door. It was almost completely silent in the room despite there being at least 30 people in there. I was doing my best not to expect the worst. Maybe this was just a false alarm. The teacher got a notification on her phone and we watched as her eyes grew wide as she read it. In a hushed voice, she informed us that there had been a murder in a neighborhood down the road from the school, and the police had reason to think the suspect was hiding somewhere nearby, possibly in the school. I couldn't believe what was happening. This seemed like something from a horror movie. One of the younger girls in the class was so scared that she was crying and shaking, and a few other kids were trying to comfort her. Because I was sitting close to the supply closet, the teacher asked me to go in the closet and grab a blanket. The supply closet was a very spacious walk-in closet with rows of shelves on either side. I scanned the shelves looking for a blanket when all of a sudden I noticed something strange. In the back corner of the closet were long pieces of fabric hanging up that were used for sewing projects. Behind the fabric, I saw a pair of dirty shoes. Someone was hiding back there. I wondered why they weren't with the rest of the class when all of a sudden it hit me. Was that the murder suspect? My heart was beating like crazy. I knew the best thing I could do was pretend I didn't know the person was there. Trying to appear as calm as possible, I grabbed the blanket before turning off the lights in the closet and shutting the door. I handed the blanket to the girl before going up to the teacher and whispering to her what I had seen. I knew if the other students found out what I had seen, there would be a panic and that would not end well. I could see the fear in the teacher's eyes, but she said nothing, just picked up her phone and sent a message to the front desk. Ten minutes of silence went by before the teacher got another notification. She then stood up and told us that she had been told that we needed to walk calmly out of the classroom and go to the middle school across the street until the school was cleared. We did as we were told. Part of me was sure that the suspect was going to chase after us, but the closet door remained shut. Once we were out of the school, we began running at a full-on sprint until we reached the middle school. We stayed there for hours until our parents were eventually able to come pick us up. On the news that night, we found out that the SWAT team came to the school and was able to capture the suspect without anyone getting hurt. A shiver goes down my spine anytime I go into the closet, even now. One day I was walking to math class and one of my friends stopped me to ask if I was ready for the test we had that day. I told her I was confused because I thought the test wasn't until next week. She insisted that it was today and she said she had been up all night studying for it. My heart sank. The test was a huge part of my grade and I wasn't prepared for it at all. I was so panicked that I told my friend to tell the teacher I was sick and I was going to hide in the bathroom. She told me she would. I quickly ducked into the nearest bathroom and went into the last stall, preparing to spend the next hour on my phone. I was hanging my backpack up on the hook on the stall door when all of a sudden an announcement came through on the intercom. It was the school principal. He said that the school was now under lockdown and that this was an emergency. Everyone was to get to the nearest classroom and follow lockdown procedures. At first I assumed this was a drill until all the lights went out, leaving me in pitch darkness. This had never happened in any of our drills before. Was there actually a real emergency? I frantically texted my friend from math class and asked her if she knew what was going on. She texted me back right away and said that a male student had been seen threatening another male student over a knife. It was supposedly an argument over a girl, but the rumor was that the guy was completely deranged and there was no telling who he might hurt. I had little to no protection, so I was terrified. I climbed up on the toilet seat so no one would be able to see my feet, and I tried to stay as quiet as possible. Several minutes went by before I heard footsteps enter the bathroom. It was someone crying, but I couldn't figure out if it was a boy or a girl. They entered the stall next to me and closed the door. I heard something metal fall on the floor, and I looked down to see the point of a long silver knife. I don't know what went through my mind at that moment, but my sheer panic caused me to make a run for it. I unlocked the stall door and started sprinting through the hallways. I kept running until I got out of the school, my arms in the air as I came face to face with an army of police officers. After they patted me down, I explained exactly where the suspect was. Luckily, they were able to catch the guy without anyone getting hurt. It turned out that the guy didn't end up stabbing anyone, he just threatened him. He did, of course, still get into plenty of legal trouble, and he hasn't been back at school since. 
When I was a sophomore in high school, I was sitting next to my best friend Kayla in geometry. The teacher had finished the rest of the lesson and was giving us the rest of class time to get a head start on homework. Kayla was trying to explain to me a problem I didn't understand when all of a sudden we were interrupted by the intercom. There was an announcement that we were under an active lockdown and everyone needed to shelter in place immediately. We asked the teacher if she had been warned that we were going to have a drill, and she told us no. The teachers are always warned about lockdown drills, so this was when we realized this could actually be a serious thing. The teacher locked the door and turned off the lights. Then we began working together to push our heavy metal desks up against the door so that no one could get in. We then hid in a corner of the room. I was tucked underneath the teacher's desk along with a few other students. We were all quiet, checking our phones to see if we could figure out what was going on. I was looking through the news app when I saw that there was a crazy man believed to be on drugs that was involved in an assault right by our school. It was believed that he may have entered our school and was still on the loose. I shared this information with the class and we were all even more terrified. A few girls started to cry and some people were texting their parents to let them know what was going on. I had a sister who was a freshman who was also in the building and I texted her to see if she was okay and asked if she knew what was going on. Fifth. Painful minutes went by before she texted me back. She said someone had been banging on her classroom door and screaming profanities for the last 10 minutes, but they had finally gone away. I decided to keep this information to myself, not wanting to freak my classmates out even more. But before long, I heard yelling in the distance and held my breath, hoping that whoever it was would just pass by the classroom. But before long, there was a sudden banging at the door, followed by a crazed laughter. The man began taunting us, telling us that he had a gun, and there was no point in hiding because he was going to get us. We were horrified but did our best to stay quiet. Our teacher was on the phone with 911, giving them a whispered update of what was happening. Suddenly, there was a loud gunshot from the hallway, causing several of us to cry out loudly. The man outside laughed even harder. There were shouts from further down the hallway, and I understood to be police officers. They demanded the man drop his weapon. After several requests, they tased him, and I heard him screaming like crazy. Around 30 more minutes went by before we were finally told that the school had been cleared, the man had been taken into custody, and we were free to go. From the time I was a junior in high school until my freshman year of college, I used to work at Target. My job that I had was a cart attendant, which means I would walk around the parking lot and bring carts back into the store. I did some other stuff too, but that was basically it. It was a busy target that I worked at with two entrances, so I would always be busy, especially on weekends. On one night, it was a weekday, and it had gotten pretty quiet. I was working a closing shift, which went until 10 p.m., and typically the last hour and a half or so would be really quiet. I was inside doing a restroom check, which was another one of my responsibilities, and then I refilled some of the shopping baskets inside the store. When I was done with those things, it was just about 10, so I went back out to the parking lot for one last time to collect all the remaining carts and bring them in. There really weren't many at all, maybe 10 total carts, but they were spread out across the entire parking lot that we had. I went out and got them all, and as I was in the far back corner of the parking lot, I noticed there was one last cart in the way back. It was literally the very far back corner, and it was pretty far away from the store. I started to walk over to it, I noticed that there was one car parked close by. The parking lot was almost completely empty, besides the 20 or so cars that belonged to employees that were all parked in the back middle. This one was farther away, and I didn't think anything of this particular car, until I realized that there seemed to be somebody in the driver's seat. I saw this as I was getting closer. The car was a sort of dark SUV that was relatively big, but I'm not much of a car expert, so beyond that I'm not sure. I had to walk right in front of the car to get the cart, as I passed by the front of the car, I saw the lights suddenly turn on. I was a little spooked at first by this, but then I just got the cart and started walking back. I glanced over to the car and noticed that the driver was staring at me with a really angry look on his face. I thought this was pretty awkward and I walked pretty quickly back to the store and put the carts away. I don't know why the guy would be mad at me, but from there, I clocked out of work, then left the store and walked to my car. I always pretty much parked in the same spot in the back middle of the parking lot. When I was approaching my car though, I now noticed that the car that I had just seen a few minutes earlier was parked directly next to me. This was sort of strange and I did my best to ignore it and got inside my car. I then started it up and left as quickly as I could because I didn't want another awkward moment with the guy. 
But as soon as I did, the car left as well. It didn't take long for me to realize that I was being followed by this guy. Every turn that I made, the car behind me would make as well. As I got close to home and had to take the exit from the highway, the car did the same. I didn't want to go straight home, so instead of turning on my street, I kept going, and then I went into another residential neighborhood and I planned to just drive around. I wasn't really sure what to do and I was getting nervous. I started just driving down random streets and then turning onto the next one and going down that. I was basically just going down every street, and the car followed me through about four streets, I would say. As I kept going, it randomly pulled out and sped past me. I heard the engine of the car make a loud roar as it did. After that, they drove away, and when I was sure I couldn't see them anymore, I turned around and went back towards my house. I got home, and then everything was fine. I've always wondered after that, though, why the person followed me and who it was. I also wonder how they knew which car was mine and why they parked next to my car. The very first night of my job as a pizza delivery guy turned out to be something that you would only expect to happen in movies. The incident gave me sleepless nights and I remember suffering from sleep paralysis thereafter. It was in February. We were nearing our closing time. The other delivery guy who would normally stay until closing time had left early that day for whatever reason. I remember him mentioning some personal unavoidable problem. All of a sudden, the phone on the counter rang. It was past midnight, and we didn't think it was strange for someone to call at this hour for pizza, probably midnight cravings. But then it hit me. I was going to be the one to deliver it. The manager had received the call and gave me the address the caller had mentioned. I looked back at him with a frustrated look and he shrugged. I had no choice. The manager said I better be quick as he would have to wait till I came back. The chef handed the pizza to me with a frown, and I could clearly read the annoyance on his face. I didn't recognize the place and the address at first, but I was accustomed to delivering to addresses I had not heard of before. This particular address was difficult to find. After a lot of hassle, I found the house at the town outskirts. It was the last house in a row of houses opposite a long stretch of thicket, Forests have often freaked me out, so I decided to make it quick and get back as soon as possible. When I neared the house, I observed the front door to be ajar. Strange. I rang the doorbell repeatedly, but no one answered. Suddenly, a gust of wind threw open the front door even more, and I was able to make out the interiors of the drawing room. Brightly lit with all the lights on and completely empty. I entered anyway and called out for someone. No sound but a low, pleasant music playing from the cassette player on the cabinet beside me. It was so eerily silent with that music in the background that I started freaking out. I could hear my own breathing. Only then, from behind the door in the far corner, did I hear a sound. I headed towards that room. Shouldn't have. When I opened the door, I was expecting the caller, but I got the nightmare of my life. It was a person, all right, but dead. Almost. The corpse was lying on the bed in a pool of blood. Its abdomen was tore open and the eyes directly looking at me. I wanted to throw up. In a split second, I was out of the house not caring about who it was or who did that or the cold pizza in the box. I ran for my life just before pausing in horror at a face staring from behind the door of the same room where I had just been. It was a man showing only his head from behind the door with a sickening smile on its face. I had been in the same room with that man for a minute or so. This was enough for me. I stepped on the gas and sped to my shop, throwing the pizza at my clueless manager. And from there to my home, where I laid for four days with a high fever. I quit my job thereafter. But what struck me afterwards was that no other houses except that cursed home had their lights on. It was like all of them were abandoned. I shrugged off that feeling at the time. But now as I come to think of that, I shudder. What was that place? I'm a 13, soon to be 14 year old female, and I go by Steph. I live in California in a small dead end sort of neighborhood. It rises above the usual street, kind of like a hill. There's only three other houses besides mine, so it's pretty safe. Because our hill has a lot of trees, I have a habit of going out at dusk all alone to watch the sunset. The time I almost got kidnapped, took place about a week ago. 
I had a plate of macaroni in my hands, so I had to be a little careful going down the slope. As I'm sitting down near the street eating my macaroni, I'm waiting for the sun to set, when a man in a car pulls up next to me. I assumed it was one of the neighbor's friends, since they had a lot of cars parked on their sidewalk, so I waved. The man didn't wave back though. Instead, he rolled down the passenger window. He was a black man that looked to be in his 40s. I could just feel something was off with him. I'm a very paranoid person, and 99% of the time my instincts are right. He then beckoned me to approach the car. Now, I've been in similar situations, so I know a thing or two. I took one step to be polite, and stopped. I smelled liquor or gasoline or something coming from his car. I guessed that maybe it was lost or something, and didn't know my neighbor's house, and I assumed that he must have brought an open six-pack or something. But being my paranoid self, I wasn't going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I think I saw some movement coming from the back window of his car. The man completely ignored the back of his car and just gave me a chilling wide smile, saying nothing. I slowly stepped back while trying to make my smile look genuine. The man began to get out of his car and my instincts told me that I was in danger. I walked slowly at first so that he wouldn't notice me getting ready to run. I'm about 95% sure that he had bad intentions. Once the man stepped both feet out of his car, I dropped my macaroni plate and made a run for it. I could feel the adrenaline overpowering my body. Once the man got fully out of his car, he yelled something at me, and I just ran faster. When I got to my house, I quickly looked around and see if he had followed me, and thankfully, he didn't. I went inside and was shaking. I laughed it off in disbelief, since I was in a state of shock and tried to calm my adrenaline rush down. My dad asked me what happened, and I told him the whole story. The lesson I've learned from this may sound stupid, but it could have almost cost me a lot, and very possibly my life. Trust your instincts. Don't wave or smile at any car or anyone that you don't know if they pull up next to you. Doing this may seem inviting for the aggressor. You don't know their intentions, and especially don't wave when you're alone. I like to think that I was smart enough to run, but this encounter made me realize just how unexpected and fast this was. Be careful and cautious everywhere, even if it's just down the street. First, a little background information. I worked the night shift at a local gas station when I was 19. I was the only employee in the store, as usual. On Christmas Eve, I had to work the overnight, 10 p.m. into 6 a.m. into Christmas Day. It was a normal night, no customers, and my cleaning was almost finished. I had just got done eating and decided to go out for a smoke when I hear someone walking towards the store in the distance. Now, this was nothing out of the ordinary, and until the person gets to the pumps and I can actually see them. It was a male, about 5'9 and somewhat thin. He was wearing a dark hoodie, jeans, and was carrying a gift bag. As he got closer though, I noticed that he was bleeding from his forehead. As he approached me, I asked if he was okay and if he needed any help. I noticed that the bag was empty, which should have been my first red flag. The guy looked me in the eyes, looking dead inside, and said, You wanna help? Then don't call the fucking cops. I agreed and told him that there was a first aid kit inside and that I'd be happy to help him with his wound. Crazy, I know, but I was just trying to be nice to him since he was someone who could be a threat to me. We went inside the store and I got the first aid kit. As I pulled out the stuff for him to clean himself up with, he said he needed to use the restroom and once again told me not to call the cops. I told myself that if he wasn't out of the bathroom within a reasonable amount of time, I was going to call the police. He didn't come out, so I went outside and called. The dispatcher told me to stay out of the store and find somewhere safe to be until the officers arrived. I stood at the side of the store where he wouldn't be able to see me, but I could see if he came out of the bathroom. 
He never came out. The police arrived and asked where he was. I pointed and they went in. Just as they got to the door, he opened it and tried to lunge at one of the officers. They tackled him through a knife that he was holding and promptly arrested him. As they were walking him out of the store, he told me that I was lucky that the police got there when they did, and that he'd see me again soon. I was a little shook by that. One of the officers came to take my statement after the other took the guy away. I told the officer what had all happened and then I asked something I really wish I didn't know the answer to. What was he doing in the bathroom? The officer told me that it was a good thing that I called when I did, because the guy had shot up some heroin in the bathroom then was going to come out with a knife, stab me, and run with what money was in the register. That's what the bag was for. This guy had a lot of problems and a lot of anger inside of him. The reason he was so angry was also the reason his head was bleeding. He owed his dealer money and got beat because of it. His solution to the problem was robbing the store. The officer told me if I didn't call when I did, I'd either be critically wounded or dead because he wasn't going to allow me to stand between him and that money. I hope I never see that crazy drug addict who wanted to kill me to free himself of debt again. A few years back, I was working the second shift at Colonial Williamsburg. I had started around 1pm, but sometimes wouldn't finish until later on at night. Colonial Williamsburg is what they call a living history museum, and it's basically that they kept a part of the city super old so it's like stepping back in a time machine without any of the paradoxical dangers, so to speak. I used to work there on the weekends when I was in high school, so that was pretty low down the chain and it was my job to turn off the lights of the governor's mansion and a few other places at the end of the night. This one night, I had just clocked out and was walking to my car when my boss called me and said that I had missed a light. I was still kind of new at the time and the idea of burning down the colonial quarter was just about the most awful thing I could think of, so I apologized a bunch and headed back to correct my mistake. Sure enough, a light way up in the attic was visibly on from outside. I facepalm super hard, head up there to the attic via the little ladder thing, but once I get up there, there's no lit candles at all. I start applying any and all logic, thinking the light we saw must have been a reflection from somewhere, and besides, it's no big deal. I'm just happy I didn't actually leave a candle on to potentially burn down one of my favorite places in the entire world. So, I shrug it off, head back down the ladder, and rebegin the walk to my car. But yet again, as I'm walking, I feel my phone vibrating in my pocket and once again, it's my boss asking if I'm actually going to do my job properly. I immediately text back that I did and get an incoming call in response. He actually seems super angry saying like, why are you lying to me, do you think I'm dumb? And a small argument unfolded before I turned around and saw that, sure enough, there was a light back on in the window of the old attic. That's when I realized something wasn't quite right, and I calmly asked my boss to meet me outside so we could both make sure the candle was put out properly, together. I had been a diligent worker for the few weeks I'd been there, but I could tell just from this that my boss thought I was crazy, dumb, or both. I mean, I'd be thinking the same thing. Who can't put out a simple candle? But as I wanted him to see, there was much more at play than that. So I meet him outside and once we've established that A, no one is playing a prank and that B, I obviously wouldn't just lie to him, we head over to the house with a lit candle in the loft. As we approach, each of us agrees that we can both see a lit candle up in the window. And by now, my boss is past thinking I'm dumb and probably just curious to see what it was talking about. But lo and behold, when we head up into the attic, there's no lit candle and I made sure to make sure that my boss goes up first so he couldn't accuse me of just snuffing it out like I'm gaslighting him or something. When I get up there, my boss has actually turned pale when he turns to me and says, You smell that, right? And sure enough, the distinct odor of a burnt candle could be smelled, and the wick of the candle was still warm and sooty. We're both right on the verge of freaking out entirely, and my boss turns to me like, you swear you put that candle out the first time. 
but just as I'm about to promise him that I did, and that something seriously freaky is going on, we hear this noise from the old wardrobe that made both of us freeze in place. It was this wheezy, raspy sound, exactly like my little cousin made during a horrible asthma attack during their seventh birthday party. I was so scared that I could practically hear my own heartbeat in my ears. I wanted to bolt out, but for some reason I just couldn't bring myself to. My boss turns towards the wardrobe like, Is... is anyone there? And then in response, we both just heard the sandpaper voice growl, Get. Out. Me and my boss almost knocked each other over trying to get to the ladder, tearing through this old colonial house that we normally treated with kid gloves. Like I think I'd have honestly smashed my way straight through a wall if I had the strength to. I was literally that terrified. Me and my boss ran to my car, him jumping into the passenger seats and me in the driver's, and we took out of there, not even caring where we were headed just as long as it was away from Colonial Williamsburg. As I'm driving, I feel my phone start buzzing in my pocket again. I can't answer because I'm driving, but from the call ID, I can see it's from the overnight security guy. I realize that he'd probably just seen, either on camera or in person, me and the boss sprinting out of the house before speeding off in my car and was wondering what the deal was. Only I realize we've also left him back there with whatever was in the wardrobe, so I'm panicking and telling the boss, Call Terry. We have to warn Terry. So, he does. And right as my boss is telling Terry to get out of there, I just hear like, uh, Terry, are you kidding me? You, you literally just scared us half to death. And that's when it hit me. Terry had been hiding up in that attic, lighting the candle, and then putting it out again when he heard someone walk into the house. And I guess scaring the life out of us was his idea of fun, as bored as he must have been. And let me tell you, that was not funny, Terry. Not funny at all. I work at a 7-Eleven part-time in between classes, and earlier this year, we got a little rush of customers in the early afternoon one time. I serve two guys for coffee and smokes, and at the back of the line, there's this kid, no older than maybe 11 or 12, just waiting there patiently with a backpack in his hand. I actually thought they looked kind of cute, like a little gentleman out doing some grocery shopping for his mom or something. He gets to the front of the line and I ask him, What can I help you with, sir? In a kind of jokey, playful way. Without a hint of emotion on his face, he just reaches into his backpack, pulls out a gun, and says, give me all the money. When he pointed it at me, I wasn't sure if it was real or not, because where the hell would a 12-year-old kid get their hands on a loaded gun like that? It's not like the 7-Eleven I work at is in some high crime area or whatever. It's actually located in a pretty nice place, and although I've heard one or two stories from co-workers about the trouble at the store, nothing had ever happened to me personally. There was one other guy in the store at the time, and I looked over at him to see him kind of smiling at the kid, smiling and frowning, like he was amused but disapproved of the kid playing some dumb childish prank. I don't know guns, but I figured this guy did, so I tried calling this kid's bluff and asked him something like, you shouldn't point toys like that, sweetie. The cops might think it's real. The kid responds by cocking the gun, and it has this real metallic sound that sends this kind of shock of fear running through me. I didn't know of any toy guns that made such a realistic sound, and as if to illustrate that he wasn't joking around, the kid pointed the gun in the air, actually fired a shot that went right over my head. After my ears got done ringing, and I came to, I heard give me all the money, in the same monotone, emotionless way, and I didn't hesitate in doing what he asked. I put as much cash as I could onto the countertop, then watched him fill his backpack with it before he just walked out of the store. I think the thing that scared me so much about it was that the kid just didn't seem to realize the gravity of the situation. He definitely seemed like he had something missing about him, like he didn't understand that he could have actually killed someone over whatever dumb thing he wanted to buy with that money, 
be it video games or candy or whatever it was. At least a grown-up armed robber understands that a gun is just a means of getting what he wanted and it's not a good idea to fire it or whatever just in case they accidentally shoot someone in the face. I get the feeling that even if I'd even tried to resist or tell the kid no, he'd have just shot me because it's what he assumed he should do. It's almost surreal to me how the closest I've ever come to death is at the hands of a child, someone who should have been so innocent and carefree and full of love, but instead just felt nothing. This story takes place one late night as I was doing my grocery shopping. I would often go shopping late at night after work, and I liked it because my local grocery store was always still open, and it was never very busy at that hour, so I could get all the things I needed in a short time. One night after work, I was shopping for some groceries, and happened to be going down the soda aisle. As I reached the end of it, I noticed something on the bottom shelf. It appeared to be a Polaroid photograph. I just found it strange for one to be in a store on the shelf, and I curiously picked it up. It was a picture of a house, and it had no writing on it in the lower area where people typically wrote. I was about to put it back on the lower shelf when I noticed something. The house looked a lot like mine. I took a really good and long look at the photo for a while, and the house in it looked just about identical to my house. I found this really strange, and ended up putting the photo back, then finished my shopping and went home. A few days later though, I was walking outside to leave for work when I noticed something on the ground. It was another Polaroid picture. I picked it up and saw that this was seemingly the same picture from the grocery store. It was the same one of my house. I knew I had left it in the grocery store the other night and I was now really weirded out by this. I took the photo with me and left for work. When I was done for the day and on the way home, I had to stop at the grocery store once again. I bought some frozen pizzas and a few vegetables and was making my way over to the pasta. The store once again was rather quiet as it was almost 11 p.m. As I was walking, I suddenly saw something as I passed from one aisle to the next. There was a man about 40 feet away from me with a camera pointed directly at me. I couldn't see his face as it was covered by the camera, but I could see he was wearing a black jacket. Just when he saw me, he ducked back behind another aisle. No doubt this was the man who had taken the photo of my house, but what did he want from me? I walked over to the aisle where the man was, but he was now gone. I walked around for a while, all over the store, trying to find the man, but I never did. I finished my shopping and went back home. After that, I never found any more pictures or saw the man again. I still wonder about him. I was dating this one girl, a long distance relationship. She lived in Washington state while I lived in California. Long distance relationships usually involved the usual, FaceTiming, phone calls, Skype, etc. About seven months into the relationship, I had a dream. The only member of her family I've seen on FaceTime was her cousin Zoe. In the dream, I was watching over her while she played in a bouncy house. Suddenly, she stopped and pointed. I looked into the direction she pointed. There was an old male, so old that gravity took a toll on his wrinkly skin. I locked eyes with him and I felt his piercing blue eyes freeze my body in place. He raised his hand from the resting place on his rocking chair. He pointed at me. His mouth opened wide as a sharp screeching noise came out of him. I woke up in a cold sweat, texting my girlfriend telling her the dream. She was shocked. She texted back, you saw grandpa? She later explained that her late grandpa's appearance perfectly fit my dream. What shocked us both was that I've never seen a picture of her grandfather, let alone knew that he passed away. He would always stay in his rocking chair and look out the window during his final days, she said. Can ghosts communicate through dreams? Can I see ghosts? Are ghosts real? I don't know if any of these will ever be answered, but I hope one day I can- I was 22 years old, attending a Halloween party at my former best friend Nick's house, who died of the heroin overdose in 2013. Before his death, he would throw big Halloween parties every year at his house, as his parents routinely flew to New York every year to attend their own friend's party. He was always a big Halloween freak, so the whole house was littered with truly horrifying props that we all knew Nick spent way too much money on. 
He even put up giant walls of cardboard and covered them with wallpapers to create a haunted maze of sorts. I want to keep this story PG-13 rated, so I'll skip the weed, beer, LSD, and sex and get right to the part where things got bad. I'll admit, we weren't in our right minds. None of us were. Anyone who came to Nick's parties knew what went down. Me, Nick, and a few other guys, Vinny G, Joey, and Q were upstairs in Nick's room smoking a bong when we heard two steady, loud bangs come from downstairs. Nick clumsily but panickingly rushed to open the door and see what was going on. There were sounds of screaming of both guys and girls. I remember quite clearly it sounded as if there were a crowd of people screaming for their lives down there. We all called Nick to come back in and shut the door. Even under the influence of drugs, we all knew what was going on. Nick ran back inside and shut the door quickly but also quietly, locking it behind him. He turned to us and had on the facial expression of someone who had just witnessed murder. What did you see? What's going on? We all shouted at him. He told us to hide before anything else. We all knew why. From that point on, we didn't ask questions. Nick hid the lights and hid in the closet with Joey, while I hid under the bed with Q, and Vinny G hid in the storage box. We could hear the blasting music from downstairs turn off, followed by a grown man screaming at everyone to shut up. One unfortunate girl let out a scream of shock and fear, and after another bang, <laughs> silence. The man started shouting at everyone again, but personally I couldn't hear it too well, and I certainly as hell wouldn't remember exactly what he was shouting. We heard two other men shouting, by now there were a confirmed three intruders in the house, but there could have been more for all we knew at that point. We heard the sound of boots stomping up the stairs and then coming halfway down the hall and stopping outside the bedroom door. The intruder on the other side of the door tried the doorknob, but when he realized it was locked, he started ramming into the door with most likely his shoulder. After a few failed attempts at that, the sound of a few shots to the doorknob were clearly enough to break the lock, allowing the door to swing open. We heard cries from downstairs after the shots to the doorknob followed by silence and gunshot. I watched through the transparent cloth that hung from the bottom of Nick's bed as the black boots with overlapping ripping denim jeans moved instinctively to the closet. He opened the door. I could hear Nick begging for the intruder not to kill him, offering a generous amount of money if they would leave. Nick gave himself up as the house owner. That's when the intruder ordered him downstairs. The rest of us stayed put. Apparently, Joey hadn't been caught with Nick. We stayed under the bed, shaking and afraid. There was near silence from downstairs, other than Nick talking with the intruders, but whatever they were saying was much too low for us to hear. It felt like a near 20 minutes before the front door slammed shut and Nick came running back upstairs to tell us that they were gone. I think the most horrifying moment of my life was when I stepped downstairs back into the living room and saw the two dead bodies laying lifelessly on the ground, holes in their heads spewing out blood. Jen and Robbie, two good friends that I still miss. I'll spare you the details of what happened when the police arrived, but despite the fact that the house smelt like a marijuana greenhouse, the police were more interested in finding out who the masked men were that killed two innocent college students. Oh yeah, Nikki told the four of us who were hiding in his room that there were four intruders in total, all wearing fedoras, masks, coats, and gloves. They demanded 100000 in cash, and when Nick could not provide it, they demanded he fill their empty sack with his most valued possessions. All of the partygoers held hostage in the room were also forced to throw their wallets into the sack or they would be shot. After the incident, Nick became depressed. He started drinking too much, becoming an alcoholic. He stopped showing up to school and ultimately ended up dropping out. He started the use of heavier drugs, such as meth and heroin. I had one good talk with him since the incident, and he was more real during this talk than he had ever been. He told me, with tears rolling down his cheeks, he lived in constant pain, knowing he caused the death of two of his best friends. Nick died of a heroin overdose in July of 2013, not even a year after the incident. 